Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Glad to see a full house. Thanks for coming. Um, my name is Gustavo Faleiros. I'm the Environmental Investigations Editor at the Pulitzer Center. I'm here with my colleagues Fernanda Wenzel, an investigative journalist from Brazil, also a Rainforest Investigations Fellow, and my colleague at the Pulitzer Center, Quek Sir Quan Keng, the Data Editor of the Pulitzer Center. So um, uh, today we'll uh, have a workshop. We hope this to be a, um, a very interactive session. We'll do a little bit different from other sessions. We want you to interrupt us if you have any questions. So this is a first rule of the session because we hope at the last part of the session you have a little bit of a practical exercise. I don't know if you have your laptops with you, but there's an opportunity for uh, follow-up uh, or follow the steps that Ken will show with some of the tools. But um, the way we, th we thought, I believe I'm seeing some familiar faces here, that some of you have been in the sessions about satellite imagery and geospatial data in this conference, which were great. Um, we attended too. What we're doing different from these other sessions is that we're using a story that Fernanda uh, did, an investigation in Brazil, as an example of how to use satellite data and geospatial uh, information on uh, environmental investigation. So it's a very concrete case. And then um, Ken will show how to use QGIS, which is a great tool for geospatial analysis for doing an investigation like Fernanda did. Um, my role here, although it's in workshops, is a bit to be a moderator of a workshop, but also to introduce you to the initiative that make us to work together, which is the Rainforest Investigations Network. So that's what I'm going to do now really quick. Um, okay. So the Rainforest Investigations Network, it's an uh, initiative that is hosted by, by the Pulitzer Center. It started three years ago. Uh, I don't know if you know uh, much about the Pulitzer Center, but it's a, a global organization uh, who supports journalists for doing ambitious projects, investigations, um, you know, uh, about every important or like depressing issues of our times. And of course, environment and climate change is one of them. Um, over the years, uh, the center has been supporting a lot of stories uh, in the tropical rainforest regions of the world, but in the past three years, uh, we realized there was more space uh, for collaboration in this area. So this is what the network is about. Uh, we do fellowships every year for journalists um, in these three regions, uh, the Amazon region, the Congo Basin, and the forest uh, and the Southeast Asia region. So the idea is that these fellows uh, will do uh, a very in-depth investigations for a, a whole year, um, and they will if possible, to collaborate among them. It could be like just exchanging methodologies. Uh, there's a lot of training during this year, but also there's a lot of opportunities for cross-border collaboration. And I think this is the, the, the most interesting part of this network, because when we start looking at supply chains of uh, several issues, I think I, I put it here, why this is important, you know, like why it's important to look at rain, uh, uh, the rainforest of the world uh, right now, is because there is a sense um, among us journalists, that these regions are really the last frontiers for destruction of several, uh, you know, like economic sectors, either for uh, obtaining uh, minerals, like what we're seeing now on the uh, green, or energy transition, we have a rush for raw minerals, and so there's a lot of uh, mining going on in these regions. There's a lot, a lot of these regions are also in the center of supply chains for food commodities, like soybeans or palm oil, um, and same thing for timber, uh, and there's a lot of land dispute because of this rush for resources. So what we are seeing is that the supply chains really connect all these regions. There are companies that are working in uh, Brazil, in Indonesia at the same time, or you have like ex uh, exports that, of food commodities that really link, you know, like what's going on in the Amazon and the Congo Basin. So these are the opportunities of collaboration. So just to give you an overview, what we do in this network and to support the, uh, the fellows, we do the financial support, so they receive actually a fellowship, but there is like editorial uh, mentoring, a lot of training. Uh, Kang is the responsible for doing a kind of a, a syllabus for the year where they do a lot of training on uh, geospatial analysis, how to use satellite imagery, how to um, do geospatial analysis. There 
was just like a something. Um, and the collaboration, as I said, is something that we, we mentor a lot, try to help like, the enablers of these uh, collaborations. And, and finally, one very interesting aspect of the Pulitzer Center is that it's not only, only about publishing the stories. There's a lot of effort to uh, connect these stories with schools and universities and doing uh, outreach activities, which means that sometimes a story uh, like Fernanda did becomes like a video, an explainer. That would be a simple thing to, uh, to explain what we do with outreach. If we have time, we're actually gonna see one of these videos, but there is, for example, um, exhibitions. We have done one exhibition in Bangkok, another one in, uh, uh, in Phnom Penh, in Cambodia, with pictures and uh, debates and dialogue. So there's a lot of opportunities to identify other audiences that are not looking at, a, uh, at your website or a, a print newspaper to make this information to get there. So this is also happening. And, and just to finalize, I want to mention that over these three years, we're in the third cohort of this fellowship. Uh, we, have, we have had 32 uh, fellowships. Some, some of the fellows renew over the years. So we had uh, 32 uh, fellows and more fellowships, in, in, in fact. And over these years, 172 uh, works or stories were published. So this is it for me. I will help with, the, with getting the questions. As I said, like when Fernanda is presenting or Kang is doing the exercise, you can just like raise your hand and say like, I didn't understand, I wanna know more. And I'll help to go around. We have a, a moderator here to help us with uh, the microphone as well. Uh, but during the exercise, I also can approach you and maybe look at what you're doing. And if you have any question, we can help in a very interactive way. So thank you very much again for being here. So and we ask Fernanda to present. Hi, <laughs> thank you for being here today. Um, my English is not quite good, so I'll try to speak very slowly so you can understand me. Uh, I will tell you about my investigation I did last year. It was a series of four story four stories that were published by Intercept Brazil. And it was a series about land grabbing in the Amazon. And I will go deep in the first of these stories and ex explain the step by step of how I did it. And I may, uh, I think you will, ap will appreciate. So the first thing uh, I want to to tell you about is a little bit why I decided to investigate land grabbing in the Amazon. Uh, and this sentence is from Mauricio Torres. He's one of the guys who knows more about land grabbing in the Amazon. And he says, the honor is who deforests. Uh, that's important because land grabbing is directly uh, related to deforestation in the Amazon. And the reason to that is because uh, every time a guy wants to take a land, uh, a public land, the first thing he will be doing will be, will be to deforest, to put the forest down. And the reason to that is because a few year, years later, he will go to the government and he will try to prove that he is the actual owner, owner of the land. And to prove that, the first thing he has to show is that he has been using this land for a long time. And the way to show you are, you are using this land is to put the forest down and then to have cattle raising or agriculture, so that's why land grabbing and deforestation are almost the same thing in the Amazon. It's important to look at it. Uh, and 40% of deforestation from 2013 to 2020 happened on undesignated public areas. These are areas that belong to the state or the federal governments in Brazil. So they are areas that belong to all Brazilian citizens. Uh, and uh, they has, has, haven't been converted yet in protected lands or indigenous territories, or even to private properties. So they are the less protected areas of the Amazon, and that's why most of land grabbing and deforestation take place in these areas. And in the last few years, so under Bolsonaro's government, uh, deforestation in these specific lands increased at almost 80%. So that's a lot. Uh, and according to Amazon, that's an institute uh, of a research institute from the Amazon, this increase in deforestation is an evidence of the pressure for such areas to be privatized. Well, so the first step I took was to decide, okay, what kind of story I want to tell and to find this story. Uh, and I want to tell a story about professional land grabbing. I want to go after the big guys and not like the small, the small farmers. Uh, and the big guys, they must have a lot of money to do that. 
because there is an estimative that the forest around uh, 1,000 hectares, you need uh, something like $200,000. So to the forest, large areas, you need a lot of money. It's not uh, cheap to do that. Uh, so, okay, I need a large deforestation if I want to tell a story about professional land grabbers. Then I went to this website. It's a platform that's called Map Biomas. It's a Brazilian platform which gathers uh, uh, deforestation alerts from many satellite systems in Brazil. So I, I tried to find the largest one, and I found the largest one. It's uh, 6,500 hectares uh, in the south of Pará State, uh, and I, I said, okay, this is a professional land grabbing. But then I, not, I need to check if this deforestation was inside a no designated public area, because that was my target of investigation. So that was the first time I used uh, geospatial data and QGIS in my investigation because I need to cross this deforestation shape file with a shape file of federal lands in Brazil, which is public, and then I could conclude, okay, this deforestation is inside the undesignated federal land, then I will go ahead with the, this investigation. The second step was to know who is behind it. Uh, and then I, uh, I use again uh, geospatial data and QGIS, and I use uh, a register that it's a key keyword for those who are investigating deforestation and land grabbing in the Amazon. That's the CAR. Uh, in English, it will be like Environmental Rural Certificate. We call, I call it the land grabber's footprint. Uh, that's a self-declaratory document, so every, every, anyone can go to this website, a, a governmental website, and say, okay, I have this piece of land, this is on my name, and then I have like a document saying that this land is in my name. It's not, a, legally, it's not a property document. It doesn't mean uh, that you are legally the, the owner. It was created to be uh, a document to try to control deforestation in the Amazon, but land grabbers managed to transform it in a way of pretending they have these areas. Uh, so, uh, I went to this website from the state of Pará. Luckily, in Pará, this data is public data. And then I could cross, again, on QGIS, the deforestation area with the CRA uh, registers. And I could find out that there, there were two ranchers uh, who have uh, registered land over this deforestation, saying that they uh, uh, were the actual, actual owners of this land. So I got to these two guys, this guy on the left, who is called Delmir Alba, and the guy on the right, who is called Jefferson. So I have two names already. In Brazil, we also have public data on environmental fines and embargoes, and then I could uh, cross the shapefile of these environmental fines and embargoes with the deforestation, I and I could understand there was a third guy involved in the, this, this deforestation, which is this guy, he's Agustinho Alba, and he's a brother of the first guy. So there was a family business. Uh, well, step three was getting to know these guys. I want to know how important they are, uh, how much money they have, uh, what uh, kind of activity they do. Uh, and again, I went to the, the CAR, CAR register, and I found out that they have many uh, properties under their names. So it was a family of landowners. There was not, not just one area, but many areas. Uh, with company IDs, I could also understand this family was working with soy. And with this other document, that's GTA, I could see that they were, were raising cattle and selling cattle to nearby slaughterhouse. The GTA is a document that uh, all the cattle ranchers, they have to issue this do document every time they want to uh, move cattle from one farm to another farm or to a slaughterhouse. It's not a public document, it's, it's private, but we managed to get some of these documents and then we could understand that they were cattle rangers as well. Uh, I also did a lot of research on social media. That's very useful to understand how important these guys were in their community. And I found out, for example, that Delmir Alba, the first guy, he sponsored the largest rodeo of his community. Rodeo is like a cowboy's party that's very common in the Brazilian countryside. So that say to me that, okay, these guys, they are quite important guys. 
Uh, I took all this information and I put in a spreadsheet, not only of these three guys, but uh, their family uh, relations as well. Uh, then I put their names, their IDs, uh, their ranches, their GTAs, uh, their social media connections, and this was very useful uh, uh, in all my investigation. Like, every time I had a doubt or I had to check something, I would go back to this spreadsheet and look at it. Okay. And the final step uh, is how did they do it? So I want to understand what kind of machinery they used to do this deforestation, how much time they took to do that. And then I had two important sources of information. The first one was a Kurt case, because these guys, they were fined by the environmental secretary uh, of Pará because of this deforestation. And then I could assess this Kurt case. And in the Kurt case, there was a report from the um, the guys of the environmental secretary that went to the area to see the deforestation and they wrote a report. And then I could see that these guys, they used to do this, this deforestation, they use chainsaws, but also tractors to do that. Uh, once again, it means they have money because uh, it's expensive to, to have tractors to, and to hire tractors to do a deforestation. That, so this court case was very useful uh, in this investigation. And the second resource I used was the satellite imagery. Uh, I could do that thanks to uh, a partnership with Earthrise, Me Earthrise Media. They are an organization that help journalists to get uh, high resolution uh, satellite imagery, which are so useful. And thanks to them, I could understand, for example, that this deforestation happened in the backyards of some of the, the farms that these guys already had. So they are actually trying to expand this, their area through this deforestation. Uh, I could also understand that before putting the forest down, uh, they, took the, they did what we call selective logging. So it's when you go to the area and you take just the most valuable wood and you sell it, and then you make money from that, and uh, many times they use this money to afterwards finance the proper deforestation. And we could also understand that all this deforestation, so 6,500 soccer fields of forest, uh, were knocked down in only four months. So it was a short period of time to, do, uh, to deforest a very large area. Uh, then talking with sources and researchers, and also with real estate uh, who works in the area, uh, we could um, understand that they uh, spent at least $2.5 million to deforest this area, but if they decide to sell it after deforestation, they will uh, earn at least $25 million. So that's a lot of profit, and it explains why these guys keep doing that over and over again. The final step was the field work. Uh, we decided to go to this area uh, in the south of Pará. Uh, we spent uh, like one month planning this travel, mainly because of safety reasons. Uh, like many other parts of the Amazon, uh, it's, uh, not, uh, it's a bit complicated for journalists to go there. Uh, it was even more complicated at that time because we were in the middle of the presidential election I don't know if you have been following it, but it was a very, very polarized election in Brazil. And in this part of Brazil, most of people are Bolsonaro supporters, so they really don't like journalists. Um, and so we took some measures to go there. For example, we bought a satellite device so we could send and receive messages uh, even if we didn't have uh, Wi-Fi or a telephone sign. And we did most of the work undercover, so we wouldn't say we we're journalists because we thought it would be much safer. Uh, and even with all these limitations we had, uh, I think it was very important to go to the field uh, because we could bring to the story like the atmosphere of the place. We could show how these uh, cities, uh, how the economy of these cities uh, rounds around land grabbing and illegal mining and, and uh, deforestation. 
and that was very important. And that's it for, that's it for me. There is my contact information. If you want to reach out. No, it, just if we have time after. Do you have any questions? We at this point, we are taking questions now. One or two, if you have any. Yes, uh, just wait for the microphone, please. Um, so I'm interested. What was it like to contact uh, the uh, the people you investigated for the right of reply, and was it? Uh, um, an intimidating experience, and what was it like when you confronted them with your evidence for the story? Uh, I just did that once I was back home. I didn't do that before going there. Uh, and no, there was not uh, any kind of intimidation, but of course they were not happy as well. They just prefer not to comment, and it was all. Yeah. You mentioned about the planning, uh, one month uh, of planning. Uh, were there any points of your trip that you felt unsafe, considering the fact that we, I think it was recently that a journalist was, uh, two journalists were murdered in the Amazon. Um, and also, could you explain a bit more of your undercover, uh, how, how you operated, and if you interviewed people, uh, how do you build trust, and so on? Uh. Actually, it was, it's quite bad to be such and safe because it limits a lot what we can do in the field. So, like, the first thing uh, I decided to do was not to spend much time in the field because we are talking about really small villages in the Amazon. So once you get there, everybody knows that there is a strange, a strange person there. So it's not, you can't just pass uh, in blank pages. Uh, another important thing is never to go by yourself. So I was with a, a, photo a photographer, a very well experienced photographer, and with a driver as well. Uh, it helps a lot. Um, but yeah, sometimes we feel a bit intimidated because you know that people look at you and, and think, no, maybe, maybe you are from a journalist or you are uh, uh, from IBAMA. IBAMA is like the environmental agency. Uh, so they, they think you are, even, even uh, if you are from the environmental agency or from, IBM, from a journalist, they look at you as uh, a menace for their business. Uh, but so what I always try to do is to not spend a lot of time there. If I feel that there is real dangers, I just go away. Uh, for example, we had a situation doing another story, but in the same trip. Uh, where we tried to make some photos of um, so, sawmill, um, of a sawmill, a legal sawmill, and then someone just came inside the sawmill and started to make videos of uh, our car, and then we just decided to go away. To go away. So we have to take care, but even though I strongly recommend journalists, if they have money for that and they have a proper safety uh, plan, to go because it's really important to be there. And just one more thing I always want to say when people ask me about safety in the Amazon, like I don't live in the Amazon. I live in Porto Alegre. I live in the far south of Brazil. So for me, it's quite safe because I will go there, I will spend like a few days there, and I will be back home. What's very dangerous is for journalists who live there and for the sources. So that's the most important thing. You have to protect your sources because you are going back home, but they will be there. So that's what makes me more concerned about, actually. About the undercover work? Uh, like, uh, I did, what you ask about the undercover work? Sorry? How was it? How was it? No. Uh, the, yeah. the only guy, like, we did some interviews, but then we would say we are journalists. Like, if we were with someone that we could trust, then we would say, okay, I'm a journalist, I want to know more about that, and then I would uh, do it on, uh, off the record, but saying that I was a journalist. Otherwise, I wouldn't do any interview.
Okay, thanks. Just a quick one on sources, because you've spoken, it's a fascinating investigation, really interesting where you got all the information. How did you identify sources and how did you make, you know, from, uh, from remotely to be able to identify sources that you could work with as part of the investigation? Uh, well, I have been working with this part of Brazil for some years, so it's a, like you have sources because you have been working with that a lot. So I knew people in the area, I knew journalists that had been there before, uh, I had contacts with indigenous communities there, uh, with NGOs, uh, so we just talk, start talking with one people, the, with one person, this person will uh, give you the contact of the other one, and that's just how, how it works. I think we <laughs> should move into the next, one more question, because we have like three minutes before what we, we plan to. Um, I'm just wondering, after the Bolsonaro presidency, a lot of the sources you used were public and kind of um, watchdogs for the forest. Has that eroded over the course of the presidency, or are those um, enforcers still strong um, with the fines and the GTAs and things like that? Uh, under Bolsonaro, what was very complicated, uh, I think, it was that like the governmental agencies that usually they were very good sources for journalists, they just stopping, stop talking with journalists uh, or because they may lose their jobs if they talk with journalists or because they were like uh, uh, supporting Bolsonaro. And so we couldn't count on them anymore. We just could rely on angels and indigenous communities and people who live there. Uh, but about uh, data, Bolsonaro tried to close some data, to hide so, some data, like deforestation data, but the pressure from civil society was so strong that he couldn't manage to do that. And like about the GTAs, uh, the cattle uh, movement data, uh, that has never been open, uh, even before Bolsonaro. And uh, that's... Uh, something that uh, the civil society have been pushing for many years, but of course we have uh, very strong interests in place, mainly for, from big uh, in, uh, beef industries who don't want this documentation to be public, so that's still a problem. If you allow me a quick comment on this, 30 seconds, as a Brazilian, I also want to comment that Equally, what happened in the U.S., Bolsonaro uh, it was negating the, the quality of the data. He was saying, like, even being the national institute, very renowned institute, national institute, like, this data is fake. He would say that. I don't believe the deforestation data. I don't believe the satellites. It became actually a good narrative for us. So is Bolsonaro against the satellites? Who do you believe, you know? So it was very common. Okay. Um, next, we are going to do a very short exercise of using QGIS to do the analysis that Fernanda just showed us. This is going to be my, the shortest QGIS trading ever. Um, I hope you um, have um, access to this Google folder that I share with you. Um, there, are some, there are some data that you know, I would use uh, for this practice. So there are two KML files. For those who are not familiar, KML simply means it's a type of geospatial data, uh, which you are able to open with geospatial software. And the software that I'm going to use is called QGIS. Sometimes people call it QGIS. Um, QGIS is a free open source software. And it has a very large user base, which means that if you've run into any problems, you can just Google for your problems. And most likely, you are able to find answers online. And the other thing, good thing about you know, popular tool is that there are so many tutorials um, on the internet. If you just go to YouTube, you know, there are plenty of tutorials that you can watch. So I'm going to do the very quick um, demonstration of you know, how Fernanda keeps saying about how we cross-reference different data set, right? So what happened is that first she found the largest area of deforestation from the uh, Map Biomass database. So that is the deforestation alert.kml file. So for those who have is running it on a computer, we can do it together. If not, you can rewatch um, the YouTube video. I think it is being live streamed. 
So if we put into the, the way to put in the map file is just you know, uh, drag and drop. And you'll see this is the area of the deforestation. If you want to know how big is the area, you just have to change your cursor. So currently, my cursor is using the hand icon. I know it's really small. Um, you just have to change it to the identify features icon. And you click on this shape. You will see there is one under derive. You will see this area. And just, you know, um, Fernando just mentioned it was uh, almost 6,500 um, kilometer square, which is a huge area. All right, so this is how you can look at, you know, how big the area is. Let me switch back to the hand cursor so I can move the map around. So once we put a map file, a shape file into QGIS, it would appear here. Here it calls, uh, uh, there's a column, the box here called layers, which means you know, all the different shape files that you can put in um, onto QGIS. So then we want to compare this um, deforestation area. We want to know, you know who registered the land um, in this area, right? Based on the CAR data um, that Fernanda got. So we are going to put the whole CAR data, which is CAR, um, Altamira, we just drag and drop here. And now if we zoom out, this is all the CAR um, data in that area. So you can see that there are huge, you know, there are plenty of CAR registered by different owners. But we just want to look at the polygons or the shapes that overlap with the deforested area. It is here, right? You can turn it on and off, right? To see the different layers. Okay, so from our eyes, you can see that these are the three polygons, one, two, three, right? But we can also isolate it, right? Let's say there are, um, let's say the shapes are not as, you know, tidy as this and you want to do some operations to um, identify the overlapping shapes, you can do that by using a tool called Extract by Location. The interface of QGIS is not the best in the world. Sometimes it feels like a software from the 90s. Um, so you just have, uh, what I usually do is that you go to Toolbox. Here you will get all the tools here. And I'm just gonna search for it. Extraction by, extract by location. So I can click on, so you can see that there are so many different functions that you can do here um, without any coding, all right? So this is, uh, that is why this is a very popular tool. You do extract by location. This is where you're able to extract the features. The shape are called features in QGIS. So we are going to extract the features from the CAR layer, which is you know, all these different shapes, based on intersect. Intersect means that you know, if this polygon intersect with another polygon on another layer, then you extract that, right? Simple. By comparing to the features from, from the deforestation alert, right? We want to extract the features from the CAR layer by comparing it to the polygon on the deforestation alert layer. Then you can then click run. Now you will have a new layer here. It's called extracted location. Right, we can close this. And now let's check the extracted location. This is a new layer, um, which is a result of the comparison between the two different layers, the car and the deforestation alert. And we can now see that these are the three um, shapes or polygons that overlap with the deforestation alert. Okay, So from here, we are able to then look at the data behind these three shapes. Again, we are able to use this identify 
um, cursor. We need to switch it to the, uh, yep, correct, um, here. And we are able to see the COD Immobile. Is that how you pronounce it? It's the code of the, the property. It's the code of the property. So using this code, you're able to cross-check with the, own, the registration database, right? To find out who um, actually registered this piece of land under their name. And this is how you're able to identify the people um, behind the deforestation, okay? So in heat, this case, I think Fernanda um, identified this piece of land, which belongs to the, the first guy, the second guy. To Delmir, Delmir Alba, this one. And Jefferson, the other one. Yeah, and then the another one is uh, Jeff. But um, you did not pursue this one, right? Because um, this one doesn't really, you know, you can see that the deforestation alert. The third one only takes up a small area of the deforestation, yeah. But probably if you check it back now, it, you know, could be more deforestation happening in that area. Who knows, right? So this is where um, you're able to very quickly find out, you know, who, uh, you are very quickly find out, uh, compare two different layers of data and to find out, you know, um, who are behind uh, the deforestation alert. So this is just a very quick example of this kind of analysis. And you can think of any other kind of data, for example, um, Fernando also look at the public, um, whether it's a public designated lens data, um, to find out uh, whether that deforestation, deforested area is a public land, right? So she did that by comparing another layer of data. So you can have multiple layer of data on QGIS, and you can do different kind of analysis, whether they are overlapping each other, whether they intersect with each, with each other, or whether they are within, they are inside another layer. And the interface is not, as you can you know, see uh, what I have shown, that it's not super complicated. Um, of course, you know, once you start using this, you'll run into many kind of issues and problems. Uh, the good thing is that you can always find some solutions online, and there are so many tutorials online. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I want to show you is that um, sometimes it would be useful if you can put a satellite imagery on this um, map so that you can see how it looks like, right? And to do that, you can load a map from Google into QGIS, which I have included in this Google Doc, how to add Google Maps to QGIS. It is very straightforward. You will just go to this Google Doc that I prepared, select the link. Let's say you want to add the Google satellite map into QGIS. Go back to QGIS, go under X, Y, Z tiles, right click on it and say, uh, click new connection. Give you a name. Um, I'm just going to put workshop. Test. Put the link of the URL here, okay? And just click, fingers crossed. I hate doing demo live because there's always problem. All right, so you, have see, you can see that there's a new map here called Workshop Test. I just created it. I'm going to double click it. Come on, yeah, cool. It works. Now you don't see uh, the polygon because simply because the the Google map is above um, the other polygons, the other layers. So what I will do here is I'll just move this layer, drag it and move it down to the bottom, and I'll be able to see um, the polygon. Here I'm, I can see you know, like what happened to this land. I can display or hide this layer. Okay. Um, I can also change the layer so that um, I only get the outline of it. Let's say I want to have the blue outline. Apply, okay. Now I only get the outline of it, and I can now, you know, um, look at it properly, like what happened to that land. Okay, of course, this satellite image is, uh, this satellite image is based on the Google image. So you need to go back to Google Map to see you know, what is the date of this 
um, satellite imagery. You guys go to Google Map, you will see that you know, that's a label um, at the bottom. So if you want to load other kind of satellite imagery, you, know, you use the same uh, method, and you're able to pull in satellite images from other platform, you know, for example, um, Bing Aerial File. Um, you can also have the, if you have access to satellite imagery database like Planet Explorer, you can install a plugin, and here you're able to pull in satellite imagery for on, on, different, um, on, on different dates um, from different satellites. So that is a, you can do everything basically on QGIS. Right, we have about eight minutes left. Um, I think that's the um, demo that I want to show to you. Yeah, as I mentioned, that's the shortest QGIS training I did. Yeah, so we actually have a video, um, oh, and also we can you know, take more questions, but let's, um, let's watch the video um, prepared by Fernanda for, his, for her story. Since the year 1500, the Brazilian forests have been invaded and robbed by powerful groups. From that time onwards, the scheme has grown and improved. Now, the thieves also use drones, cell phones, computers, and they do all of that shamelessly. Our team has investigated the land grabbing industry, and we're going to tell you how these millionaire groups operate in Brazil. Here's the spoiler. It's a professional scheme. In 2020, the highest deforestation in the history of the Amazon rainforest was detected. In a matter of months, 16,000 acres of forest turned into smoke. This amounts to 6,500 soccer fields. The region is located in the south of the state of Pará. Those responsible invested about $2.5 million in deforestation. A few chainsaws here, a couple of fires there, and finally, plenty of pastures. Once it's cleared, this area can be worth more than $20 million. With that much profit, the real estate market has been heating up. Anyone interested in taking part in the theft of public land can simply get in touch with one of the many realtors in the region. The ads are brazen, and the commissions are in the millions. We spoke with realtors who offered various farm options. Prices would range from around $5 million to $20 million. And here's an important detail. For the scheme to work, the criminals need to properly pick the area. They don't want to invade private property or a protected area, which would only cause them trouble. The main target of this market are unassigned public lands, the so-called glebes, which belong to the Brazilian people and have not been converted to conservation units, indigenous lands, nor private properties. 40% of the tree cutdowns between 2013 and 2020 happened in those areas. They are the go-to option for land grabbing or grillaging. In the old days, land documents were forged with the use of crickets or grilush, the actual insects. That's because the animal's poop has an aging effect on paper. That's where the Brazilian word comes from. Land grabbers today use other tricks, such as the online document called Rural Environmental Registration, the CA in Portuguese. It is far from being a property title, but in the hands of land grabbers, it disguises the crime. To do the registration, you have to hire an experienced professional. That's where the land grabbing engineers come in. They take huge farms and turn them into smaller areas, as if they were a puzzle. With that, it is easier to put the property documents in order. In southern Amazonas, the fellings have advanced at an intense level. That's where the glebe of João Bento is located. Like termites in the woods, loggers have been devastating this area and have already turned half of it into pastures. In the past nine years, 45,000 trucks loaded with logs were taken from the glebe of João Bento. If you line them up, the vehicles would form a 280-mile chain. It's the same as the distance between the cities of São Paulo and Curitiba. The glebe of João Bento is the last barrier before an important block of protected areas. Nearby, there is also the Cachararí indigenous land, which loggers are already invading. My father was here, where now is all a fazenda. Não era fazenda, aqui era só só a floresta mesmo, né? Não existia negócio de fazenda não. Agora a nossa área indígena está cercada de, de fazenda, né? Só onde tem mato mesmo, só onde nossa área que está demarcada, né? 
E mesmo assim os fazendeiros vão e encostam dentro, mesmo na nossa divisa, né? Aí eu já fui ameaçado, né? Já com armas por na minha casa, me ameaçaram eu, a minha família, né? Falando que se eu continuasse a denunciar, tá passando o conhecimento daquilo que está acontecendo dentro da aldeia, nós ia eles iam eliminar minha família. Of the more than 330,000 cleared acres in the glebe of João Bento, half was felled during Bolsonaro's administration. All throughout the Amazon, deforestation in public lands without destination rose almost 80% from 2019 to 2021, when compared to the three previous years. One of the most efficient ways to protect the forest is to transform the glebes into conservation units or indigenous lands. But that is exactly what Bolsonaro did not do. During all of his administration, a total of zero conservation units and zero indigenous lands were created. This emission comes from previous administrations, and the land grabbers still count on the help of Congress people to change the law. It works like this. The land grabber invades the public land, clears the forest, then lobbies to change the rules, and there you go, it's legalized. We're talking about a gigantic machine with a lot of people involved. From the powerful who fill their pockets to those who do the heavy lifting of felling the forest. While a few make a lot of money, the rest of the whole world pays the price of the destruction of the largest tropical forest in the planet, which is key to contain global warming. Access the Intercept Brazil website to read the full series of stories. Yeah, I think um, we can have um, one more questions. We still have two minutes. Um, there's one question at the back, last roll. We, we also have like two more fellows here uh, from the Rainforest Investigations Network. Yao Hua and Lili is here. So if you want to know more about the networks. Yeah, yeah questions. <coughs> Hello, so I wanted to ask, like, uh, what has been your relationship with maybe activists or indigenous activists that, uh, like, fight for the same thing on the field? Like, I do activism in Italy, and I know that for the people that do it there it is much more dangerous, and it's also a lot of energy to try to get all this data. So it's amazing when they kind of <laughs> have it all together, and, like, you do that huge part of the job, and I was wondering what were maybe, I don't know, ways in which you collaborated or did things together? Uh, well, we collaborate a lot with activists uh, from the Amazon. Uh, most of times they are our main sources. And uh, I think the most important is to create a trust relationship with them and to make sure that sometimes they will give us the information but their names will be protected and so we, they can keep helping us uh, to, to make these, these investigations. Uh, but for sure they are very, very important. And mostly under Bolsonaro's government, when we couldn't count on governmental agencies uh, for most of information, uh, this kind of, of people and organizations, they were just crucial to us to keep doing our job. One more information about this. There are various NGOs doing very sophisticated, this kind of work, geospatial analysis. So sometimes we benefit from their satellite imageries and analysis for doing this work. And the other thing that we implemented in this network is a, a leaks channel. So we do receive some leaks also from people who are working for governmental agencies, um, sharing some videos sometimes. That happened, we had a big story about a, a, a legal mine that was shared with us through this channel. Okay, we have to finish. Thank you again for being here. Thank you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask everybody to leave quickly because we need to sanitize and we need to make another run. Thank you.
I'm gonna ask everybody to move your conversation out of the building. You have a big street where you can do all the conversation that you want. Thank you. Not out of the door, not on the stairs, out of the building. If someone don't understand the conversation out of the building,